Good evening, everyone. My name is Ann Mosley. I'm the director and curator of the Sigmund Experience at the University of Illinois at Springfield. Tonight, I am kicking off our uh, Women's History Month by talking to you about a series of trailblazers that are from the Central Illinois area. But before we get started talking about our trailblazers, um, I want to introduce you for those who are new to our programming um, to the Sangamon Experience. Uh, the Sangamon Experience is a exhibit location with, on the campus of the University of Illinois at Springfield that seeks to explore uh, diverse stories throughout the central Illinois area, normally that are overshadowed by big histories. Uh, this gives us an opportunity to highlight the local history that we have in our area. Now, this month, uh, we will be talking about our community trailblazers within um, our communities that highlight women. And this month is going to be pretty interesting because we will be talking about uh, not only uh, women who have made a uh, national uh, name for themselves, but we'll also be talking about women who just took care of the home front. Uh, that cared for their families, their communities, and made a big difference in the lives of the people that surrounded them. Tonight, I'll be talking to you about women who uh, were supporting their families and, in a sense, supporting their community by fighting for the right to keep their children at home and to care for them. So we will be just diving into the women who fought for mothers' pensions. Uh, we'll be focusing on Montgomery County, which is in the southeastern part of um, the central Illinois area. Uh, the last few months, we've been talking about Sangamon County and celebrating the 200th anniversary. Now we're diving into the counties that uh, are around us, and it'll be exciting to discover more. Um, but as always on the Community Trailblazers program, um, I'm talking to you about discoveries that have been found within uh, local records and showcasing what, what I've been able to discover in the midst of my research. Um, but if you have a story that feels like needs to be shared, that is very important to you and your community, feel free to email the Sangamon Experience at uis.edu. And we'd be more than happy to dive into it. The more we know about our local history, the more we're able to be better understand our communities and where we have come from um, and prepare us for the current present, um, but also prepare us for the future and binds us in a way that allows us to grow and flourish as communities. So tonight I'm going to be talking a lot about mother's pensions and I'll be giving some examples. If you have any questions, feel free to uh, post them in the comments. Be more than happy to uh, try to answer those as uh, best as I can. But again, I'm going to strongly encourage you, like in every episode that we have, to go and seek out the resources within your own backyard. Uh, so checking out those local archives, our libraries, um, and discovering more about the communities that we live in. So I'm going to share my screen here, and we are going to jump in and learn more about uh, mother's pensions here in the Central Illinois area. All right. So the fight for mother's pensions. So what I'll be talking about today is the struggle that we have gone through over the years to discover how do we care for each other. Um, and a lot of times we learn those from our parents, sometimes uh, mostly from our mothers, uh, who tend to be the um, individuals who stay home and nurture the children, at least traditionally and within society. So um, where do we all start? How do you find these pensions? Um, how do you learn from them? Well, uh, a lot of the records that I will be talking about this evening come directly from our own Illinois State Archives in our regional depositories. So what is the Illinois Regional Archives Depository at UIS? Well, it is the State Archives um, and what it is, it, there are sections throughout the state 
where local records are kept for people to be able to do research. Um, also, these are managed by interns who uh, work with the state of Illinois to help organize and um, help researchers with discovering local records and how they can apply to research, but also uh, genealogical discoveries as well. Now at UIS, uh, the IRAD, uh, so the UIS depository uh, covers the counties of Bond, Cass, Christian, Fayette, Green, Jersey, Macon, McCoupin, Mason, Menard, Montgomery, Morgan, Salmon, and Scott counties. Long list there. Um, the biggest county that uh, UIS covers is McCoupin. And a lot of times uh, in visiting a depository, a lot of people are looking for marriage, birth, and death records. But there is a treasure trove of other documents that are very useful to researchers uh, to gain a better understanding of not just families, but also uh, the shaping of county governments. So you have school board minutes, you have county board minutes. Um, in addition to that, you have deed records um, and you also have treasury accounts uh, for each county and how they've managed their funds. Um, deed records are so important to look at because it gives you an idea of how counties have been formed and shaped. And it also uh, gives you an idea of um, plots of land that have been settled over the years. Uh, a lot of times in looking at county board minutes, you can see how funds for the county are spread out. And that's kind of how we got branched into the mother's pension files. Because early on, uh, there were funds that were set aside um, for the welfare of the county. Sometimes it would go towards roads, it could go towards uh, the poor relief, um, but you also had portions of funds that were set aside for special projects as well. And some of those included charitable causes, um, even though churches made up a lot of the uh, organization for uh, charitable use. Uh, in addition to that, it would also go to hospitals and medicines and paying for uh, county staff members. Um, this included your coroner, your uh, sheriff, your, um, you also had the mayor's position. So a lot of uh, county positions were also funded through this as well. Um, so in looking through the depository, uh, there are a large number of um, poor relief, blind, uh, blind pensions, as well as uh, mother's pension files within the Montgomery County records. Um, and this was very interesting because uh, in looking at them, uh, you get a large batch after 1911. And what's interesting about these is in diving in, um, I went in with the mindset that they, there would be a lot of mother's pensions for wives and mothers of those who worked within the coal mines within Montgomery County. Um, but found that uh, each mother's pension file has its own story to tell. But in order to gain a better understanding of what uh, mother's pensions were and how they got started, we had to go back a little farther um, within not just the county's history, but the state's as well. So um, the laws that were put in place, uh, the first one that was enacted was in 1899. Um, where we have the Illinois Juvenile Law that is put in place. Um, so this law was put in place July 3rd of 1899. Um, I was able to get a lot more information from the Illinois Supreme Court website. They have a whole section on the history of juvenile law. Um, there are some wonderful historians there. Um, they're their leader at the Supreme Court Archives, John Lupton, um, is very knowledgeable about the different cases uh, that were put into place um, here in Illinois. Um, and he provides a good example of what juvenile law is uh, within the state. Um, so it took effect July 3rd of 1899, uh, marking the beginning of a separate court experience for children uh, 16 and under. Uh, the new court focused on rehabilitation. It differed from criminal courts by treating the child as a person in need of assistance uh, rather than a 
um, punitive justice for the crime. Uh, the Illinois Juvenile Court was the first of its kind, and soon after, other states passed similar laws. Uh, within a few decades, uh, every state and a number of other countries had juvenile court systems. Uh, prior to the passage of the 1899 Act, uh, there was no mechanism for dealing with children accused of a crime, um, and children were charged, jailed, and punished as if they were adults. Um, progressive era reforms um, ended up modernizing and uh, they ended up changing for uh, rehabilitations so then children can start to reenter society um, and also provided a different court environment. Mm -hmm. uh, juvenile court proceedings were confidential um, so that children could attempt a normal life without the stigma of a criminal record. Now, in looking at Illinois juvenile law, um, you get an opportunity to see how law changes um, affect the lives of children. But this starts to also look at um, parents and how they raise their children as well. Now, um, when looking at the juvenile law, you also have to look at um, the different economic well-beings of each family. Um, and how it is affected by um, the treatment of children. Are they working uh, types of education? This is what uh, drove a lot of the legal changes within the state. Then you have the mother's pension law in 1911. Illinois was the first uh, to put together this type of pension. Um, the Illinois 1911 Mother's Pension led to the state's uh, enactment of Mother's Pension Law, which is added on to the 1899 law that was put in place. Um, now, Mother's Pension Law was uh, basically funds to parents. Uh, it's an amendment to the juvenile law and was intended to enable the court to deal with um, family. Uh, different families and not to deprive them of the custody of their own children um, because of poverty. Now, this act authorized uh, courts uh, to create, make decisions based on whether or not parents were fit guardians of their children um, and whether or not they were able to care for them. Uh, and they didn't want uh, the lack of funds to be the reason why children were taken away from their parents. Um, the mother's pension law that was put into effect under the juvenile law um, was the first step in um, the process of creating the United States welfare policy. Um, and these programs granted public um, assistance to women depending on led on the legislation that were either widowed, divorced, or had been deserted by their husbands or whose families um, had severe economic need. Um, and this was the first to be uh, enacted in the state of Illinois and then later on uh, was developed um, throughout other states throughout the country. Now, these laws... Um, allowed financial assistance for needy parents uh, to keep their children in their own homes with them. Um, and this marked a sharp break with past thought. Um, when children whose fathers had died were routinely bound out to others, um, if their mothers didn't have assets to care for them. For example, in Virginia, as far back as the 1660s, uh, the law had provided that an orphan's estate wasn't enough for uh, the child support, the child was to be, quote, bound apprentice to some handicraft trade until one and 20 years of age, except some kinsman or relation will maintain them for the interest of a small state that they have, unquote. Now, private charities had stepped into the gap, um, particularly in some large cities as the population grew, but many of those charities required mothers to put their children into orphanages or foster care, even though that was generally far expensive, far more expensive than keeping the children in their own homes. Uh, the notion of public aid for mothers and children wasn't 
even seriously considered until 1898 when the New York legislator, legislature passed a bill to provide relief in New York City for widows, um, and it didn't become law because the governor refused to sign it. What changed the was the attention of the government to those higher costs of out-of-home care, uh, starting with the 1909 White House Conference on the Care of Dependent Children. Um, that conference concluded um, who was best suited for to provide social welfare when the family unit failed to do so. Well, the financial need of American mothers was, by the first decade of the 20th century, a problem in need of a solution. Um, it proved that uh, within different governments um, on a local and state level that um, the cost to the state uh, to care for orphans was a little bit more expensive. And so they thought in providing funds to help aid mothers in keeping their children, they not only save the state money, but they also provide um, a avenue for mothers to keep their children in the home, which provided more of a stable uh, well-being for their children and also provided a better future for them. Um, so in diving through the mother's pension law, but also the juvenile law, uh, we start to see this progressive movement in trying to provide welfare programs for mothers and their families. Now, um, why did we start looking at this in 1911? Well, uh, there were some big changes that were happening, mostly on a industrial level. Um, more companies were building these uh, big um, industries within the larger cities, um, and industrialization was taking over. Um, and in the midst of that, you also find that there are some rural communities that are becoming um, a bit sparse in population because a lot of people are flocking to the urban centers. So Chicago, Springfield, St. Louis, um, the, these bigger cities are becoming industrial hubs. Um, so living conditions become uh, called into question. And then in addition to that, uh, we also see the rise in cost of living and people trying to adjust to that. Um, you also um, have a um, growing population of larger families uh, starting to happen as well. Now, um, as we see our bigger cities grow due to industrialization, uh, you also start to see a rise in um, mothers needing aid um, because of husbands uh, being hurt on the job. In addition to that, you have a number of coal mines that are in um, big operation during this time. And there's not a lot of regulation in regards to the care of workers and employees at this, um, at this moment in our nation's history. Um, you have a, a number of coal mine disasters happening uh, within central Illinois. One that takes uh, the, the most news is the cherry mine disaster that ends up happening in the northern part of Illinois. Um, a few years back, there was a wonderful exhibit at the Abraham Lincoln Presidential Library um, on that specific disaster, which led to the creation of a lot of OSHA laws that were put in place. Um, but the county that I'm going to be paying close attention to uh, that we have a large number of records for is Montgomery County. Uh, Montgomery County is in the southeastern part of Illinois. Um, when you look at Sangamon County, so southeastern part of central Illinois. Um, during uh, the time that I'll be looking at, which is from 1911 up until the 1930s, um, I'll be looking at um, the mothers that filed for pensions during this time. Um, in going through the pensions, um, around 95 mothers aid applications uh, were available from August of 1924 to January 1932. Uh, from Montgomery County, and it reveals concerns stemming from the worries of prominent white male citizens and the effects of industrialization and immigration in the area, uh, which prompted the ado uh, adoption of 
and guided the administration of local mother's pension programs within uh, Montgomery County. Now, I've been very fortunate, and when I dove through these records, I was gaining a lot of insight um, on these mothers and the lives that they led um, and the struggle they had to hold on to their children, to care for them and have the funds to make sure to pay the rent, to buy food, um, to buy clothing for their growing kids, but also I uh, took for medical aid, not only for their children, but also for themselves. Um, and what was very fascinating was the, the fact that a lot of these uh, pension files had a lot of very personal information within them. Um, I also was very lucky that a uh, former um, friend of mine who uh, was a student at UIS around the same time as I was, um, she ended up writing an article for the Illinois Journal um, on mother's pensions. And uh, by utilizing some of the research she's done, it provided a lot more of an insight into what was happening within the state um, and how mothers' pensions made an impact on not just the mothers uh, within the communities, but the children and the counties themselves. Now, um, the idea of the mother's pension in the state of Illinois when it was created was uh, there was a lump sum of funds that a state put together um, and was available for counties to use. Now, the counties made the decisions on who received these mother's pensions, uh, but also um, they made the decision on how much money each mother would get. Uh, and that all de determined um, the age of the child, um, how many children they had, um, and also the need. Um, and each mother had to provide a series of information. For example, on some pension files, um, you had mothers who put together a detailed list on how much everything within their budget costs. Um, so what was an average week for them? Uh, how much was rent for the week? How much was food for the week? Um, sometimes they provided receipts um, to provide evidence on how much uh, their cost of living was. Um, so the first law uh, that was put in place that I spoke about, which was the Funds to Parents Act, also the Mother's Pensions Act, um, by June 30th, 1930, 44 other states, as well as territories of Alaska and Hawaii, had adopted similar mother pensions legislation. Um, Julia Lathrop, who was the head of the United States Children's Bureau, um, she ended up stating what this law means and how uh, it's going to affect uh, families throughout the country. She ends up stating uh, it is against sound public economy to allow poverty alone to cause the separation of a child from the care of a good mother. She also wrote, um, or to allow the mother so to exhaust her powers in earning a living for her children that she cannot give them proper home care or protection. In addition to this act that was put in place, there was an Aid to Mothers and Children Act that was put together in 1913. This version of the law, according to 1921 report, states, practically restricted uh, the pension grants to destitute widowed mothers who had children under 14 years of age and who could prove citizenship and residence in the county for a period of three years. This law was put in effect when Montgomery County adopted the Mother's Pension Program. As a result, gender became a defining element of public aid for parents. Women could be considered dependent on, on the government. No men were ever eligible. And this is the case specifically for Montgomery County, Illinois. Now, according to uh, Amanda Deliquist, um, when she wrote this article, um, she stated that the first woman to receive a pension within Montgomery County um, was Lottie Palmer. Um, and she ended up um, 
becoming a widow at the age of 28. Um, her husband of eight years died. Um, she was a homemaker and she was left with a mortgaged farm outside of Walshville, Illinois, um, without the financial means of supporting her two surviving children, Ruth and James. Um, and they were the ages of seven and eight. She sought help and applied uh, to Montgomery County's officials for public aid under the Aid to Mothers and Children's Act. After reviewing her application, uh, County Judge John Lewis Dreyer approved her request, and on December 9th of 1913, the Montgomery County Board of Supervisors, who held physical control over the county's funds, authorized and granting um, her $24 per month, um, and sh she became the first woman to receive the mother's pension. Now, while the law was vague in Montgomery County, um, they still applied it and stressed rigid requirements, um, stated that the law was in, was uh, in, interpreted in its ambiguities and manner to reflect the dominant idealized expectations held of single mothers. And according to, Man to Amanda, um, this is what they um, felt the standard was in order to receive a pension. You had to have sexual chastity physical conservat conservatism, feminine moral superiority, and a dedication to child rearing. Um, in looking at the mother's pension files, you'll see a lot of the pensions that were um, approved. Uh, a lot of these mothers had to write which church they attended. Um, they uh, um, often ended up asking members of the church to write letters of recommendation for them. Um, discussing their character, um, how they treat their children. Um, also, the cleanliness of one's home uh, determined the num the amount that they would receive for a pension, and also if their children attended school. Uh, those were some of the guidelines that allowed you success in receiving a pension. Now, um, one of the big things that I saw in going through a lot of the files um, was that um, a lot of these women who were taking care of their children and relied on aid was mostly because of uh, tuberculosis took, taking their husband either from them uh, because they ended up passing away or they had to be um, sent to a tuberculosis hospital up in Springfield or um, they ended up uh, perishing in an autom automobile uh, accident or hit by a train. Uh, there were a few other cases where husbands were um, physically abusive, and so legal action needed to be taken to separate the father from the home. Um, but another large stack of uh, mother's pensions that were collected were because husbands perished in mining accidents. About 95 applicants for mother's pensions in Montgomery County between 1924 and 1932, at least 11 had a family member employed by the mining industry. Six of these women lost their husbands to work-related accidents. Um, and that's based on some of the files that I saw. Um, and according to Amanda, um, there were a large number of them because she went on digging uh, even further into census records and death records as well. Um, and in diving in even more, if you look at the death record toll in some of these surrounding counties, you'll see a lot of uh, mine incidents that ended up happening. Now, in going through a lot of these files, I ended up picking a few. Um, as stated earlier, there was a large number of case files um, pertaining to mother's pensions. And here are some that I um, have drawn out for you to be able to see. Um, so you have Stella Hadley in 1924. She applied for aid um, through Montgomery County. And she ended up um, asking for aid due to the fact that her husband passed away. Um, and if you look closely enough at this particular file, I know the screen's kind of small, um, but when she applied, uh, she stated that her husband suffered from tuberculosis. Now, 
tuberculosis was one of the leading cause of deaths in the nation during this time. Um, they did not get their TB shot. Uh, they didn't have one at the time. They were still trying to figure out how to um, curb the death toll of TB. Uh, you had the uh, tuberculosis hospital in Springfield. Um, and when complications would arise, they would be sent to the Jacksonville hospital and asylum, uh, for lifelong care as well. Now, when she was filling out this particular application for aid, um, as you go down the listing, um, she had to prove citizenship as stated earlier. Um, in addition to that, she had to provide citizenship, um, evidence of her husband, uh, details about his death. She also had to provide a signature from the doctor in the coroner. And as you'll see down below um, in her first file, she ends up writing to whether or not she's been divorced. And that plays a factor within her application status. Um, in addition to that, um, you go to the second page and you see a listing of how many dependents are in her home. So you can see uh, when each child was born, where, and who they were the child of if the person had multiple husbands. Um, in addition to that, you had to provide um, some different contacts for them, whether they be family members um, and their state of dependency. So do you have family members that could help uh, in time of need? Uh, in addition to that, um, do you have any individuals who can speak for your moral character? Um, and that goes on the second page. And finally, the last page is where you get the signatures and also what type of work uh, each person had. So in looking at these, we get a better idea of basically the life of Stella um, in 1924. But in addition to that, for those doing genealogical research, if you're able to find a family member within the mother pensions files, um, it leads you down to other branches of family trees. Um, but it gives you also an idea of the economic well-being of uh this particular family and also the bravery that it took Stella to actually go and apply for aid. Uh, this is just one uh, form that she filled out. Uh, in addition to that, she would end up having a parole officer come to her home and evaluate um, her standard of living, um, would question her. Um, it would also be a part of the process that she may have to come in um, in front of the Board of Supervisors and argue her case. They would ask her a series of questions. Um, a lot of them are the same questions that she answered on her application, but they're finding different ways to verify um, her uh, information and making sure that she's telling the truth. Another form that I was able to find uh, was from Ethel M. White. Um, Ethel May, May is her middle name. Um, in 1930, when she filed uh, for aid, and I ended up uh, showing you some of the letters that were written. So you have an idea of what the application looks like. But in addition to that, um, here you have an example of the letters um, and evidence that was brought up. Um, against Ethel May. Now, Ethel, uh, she ended up having some very interesting things happen to her. Um, I ended up picking her file because she is a woman of a different race. Um, and it shows how different counties ended up um, treating others of different uh different racial backgrounds, um, not just because of their gender, but also because of um, where they come from as well. Um, but uh, what's tricky about this particular case is the fact that she was initially given aid, but it went, came to find out that she um, di did not remarry. Uh, she ended up going down a different path in life, um, and they refused to give her aid because of her lack of a moral compass um, so they ended up calling her, um, uh, oh, that she had an it quality. Um, but this is something the county 
called to mind in the midst of the growing urban center that uh, Hillsboro ended up uh, being at the time. Um, but they would come across different cases where either women were making too much money or in the midst of the application process, they were remarried um, or um, when they go to reapply for aid after receiving it and then having it being canceled at one point or another um, to come to find out that they no longer fit the criteria to receive uh, a pension. But again, it came down to the counties. The county board at the time uh, would make the rules and regulations. In addition to that, they would end up uh, deciding who would receive the aid and they would base it off of the application itself. Um, and again, it became a gender uh, stereotype at this time that women had to fit a certain role within society. Um, and if they did not fit it, then they did not receive the aid. And sadly, this was the case quite a bit during the 1920s. Now, as we get into the 1930s, uh, we start to see a change in how um, the county is recording um, finances. They're also um, recording the uh, comings and goings uh, to make sure that each person was um, stable enough to be at home with their children. Um, and so we see in the case of Catherine Fullerton. Um, so in 1937, Catherine Fullerton uh, files for aid. Um, and you see a listing here of a lot of the different finances that she had, how much it cost her. Um, and you also get a chance to see um, how much fuel was at the time because you you see her driving a car. Um, you also see how much it cost for her to receive medical care um, and when she received it. Um, you, in addition, uh, get a chance to see um, each cost being authorized um, by a particular probation officer. Um, in addition to that, um, you get a chance to see um, who was running her case as well. When she goes to uh, fill out her application for aid, um, she has a packet she has to fill out. And I, I copied a few of the pages from her packet, um, but it gives you her address, where she was living, um, her date of birth. Um, but then you also get a chance to see um, where she was married, um, which was in a different county. Um, but you also get a chance to see something that's very similar, and that is um, Catherine Fullerton's uh, husband ended up dying in a mine accident, uh, which was quite common. Um, so uh, Catherine, when she was going through this process, uh, she was filling out some sensitive information in regards to um, her, her life, her husband's life, um, but also... Um, how she would care for her children. Um, now, as I stated earlier, a lot of these mother's pension files ended up um, being a part of a larger collection of items that gave you an insight into life in industrialized Illinois um, and, how, and its effect on rural communities. And Catherine and Ethel and so many women ended up um, having to adjust their lives on a grand scale because of a loss of a husband. Now, there were some that were quite uh, shocking for me to read uh, because of the conditions that women were living in. Um, there was one woman that I read, um, her husband was still living, um, but he was suffering from tuberculosis. He was initially at the Springfield Hospital, but then what ended up happening was um, he was determined to be insane. Um, whether this was the cause um, of his illness, of having tuberculosis and then having it, it affect him mentally, he was eventually moved to the Jacksonville Asylum and she was left to care for her children. 
Well, what ended up happening was he was in the asylum for over 13 years and her health was failing. And so she was being taken care of by her 17 year old daughter um, who ended up filing uh, a mother's pension form for her um, because she couldn't do so herself. And so we see these women um, working as hard as they can uh, to make sure that they can keep their children at home and still receive funding from their county to support them. Um, and illness and coal mine disasters, uh, while they were the leading cause, they weren't the only. Um, there was one case where a husband committed suicide and left um, his wife and children to care for themselves. Um, and so a lot of these mother's pension files are very heartbreaking. Um, but what gives me a little bit of hope is, and some, uh, some inspiration here for the welfare system that this kickstarts, um, is the fact that there were some cases in here where there are letters written back to, uh, the board of supervisors thanking them for providing funds when they were needed and seeing mothers get back up on their feet and uh, having their children continue to live with them and eventually go off and start lives of their own. Um, and then the mother being able to be taken care of by those children that she worked so hard to, to keep together. Um, so those are some inspirational stories that can be found within the applications as well. So in diving through these, you get a sense that um, while industrialization was happening, while uh, coal mining became a top um, economic driver here in central Illinois, um, that you don't just have coal mines within uh, Montgomery County, but you have them in Macoupin, you have them in Sangamon, um, throughout the surrounding counties in central Illinois. Um, but you also have mothers being affected by uh, the dangers of working within coal mines um, and being affected, too, by these industrial centers um, and unclean living conditions within urban settings. But then you also get a chance to see how um, economic difficulties can also cause families to lose the family farm. Um, and there are a lot of instances within the, these mother's pension files that we can learn about the cause and effects of uh, counties and what they have on the families that live there um, and what their board of supervisors are able to provide them. Um, it also gives us another look at the welfare system that we have within the state of Illinois. Mothers' pensions, juvenile cases being the starting point, uh, but for and seeing how much the welfare system has grown and how it has benefited um, the citizens of the state of Illinois as well. So I hope you get a chance to dive into these files um, that we have at the Illinois Regional Archives Depository here at UIS um, because it gives you an insight into the communities that we have here in Central Illinois. But in addition to that, um, it gives you an idea of um, how the welfare system has been used in the past. Um, and one thing that I found in the midst of trying to discover more, uh, I was able to find a very interesting article by Mark Leff called the Consensus for Reform, the Mother's Pension Movement in the Progressive Era, where he states, home life is the highest and finest product of civilization. It is the great molding force of mind and of character. Children should not be deprived of it except for compelling and urgent reasons. Children of parents of worthy character, suffering from temporary misfortune, and children of reasonably efficient and deserving mothers who are without the support of the normal breadwinner should, as a rule, be kept with their parents, such aid being given as may be necessary to maintain suitable homes for the rearing of children. This provides us um, with some insight into um, the, the lives of individuals within central Illinois. And it provides us with some uh, 
outlook on how we should care for those in need within our communities. All right. Now, it looks to me like we have a little spammer on our feed. And uh, I would recommend that you do not look and click on any of the listings that we have here. Um, so if you do end up having questions in regards to what is held at the um, Illinois Regional Archives Depository, I highly recommend that you reach out to our special collections um, and take a dive into the archives and learn more about the amazing collections that we have within the state archives, but also in the special collections at the University of Illinois at Springfield. I hope you enjoyed our program and that you will tune in next time when we discover new trailblazers uh, within the Central Illinois area, focusing on the women of Central Illinois. Thank you for joining.